because it frames our discussion point on how broad the open meeting law is. So we all know that the meeting is a deliberation amongst the quorum of a public body to discuss matters within the jurisdiction of the public body. So how many of you here are members of a public body in town? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And how many are employees? Perfect. Great. I just like to get a sense of what the employee So we know what a quorum is. I've included the definition there. What's important about the definition of deliberation is that it includes electronic communications. So we all know deliberation is when a public body meets in a meeting and discusses matters within its jurisdiction. But the Attorney General's office that is charged with enforcing deliberation and open meeting law enforcement has held, and the definition includes, any written or oral communication from any medium, including electronic mail. So certainly there has been an increase in the past five or ten years in the use and proliferation of electronic mail, and so we're going to be cognizant of the use of electronic mail to conduct public business, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit as well. We know that a quorum is a majority of the full complement of members of a multiple member body, except in very limited circumstances. So that's just good to keep in mind when we talk about what the deliberation is. And we know that public body often includes subcommittees. So towns need subcommittees often, or subcommittees are created by other public bodies to conduct public business or to advise that other public body. And we know that a subcommittee is included in the definition of a public body for purposes of the open meeting law. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> so if we go to the next slide, um, I want to break down the three main components of what the open meeting law requires. I think it's really important just to keep all of that in mind. So, I've done it chronologically because that's how my brain works, and I think most of us are used to dealing with these items chronologically. We know that the open meeting law requires notice, and we'll talk about the timing and when that meeting has to be posted. We know that the notice has to include the location of the meeting, including any ADA accessibility that is required, or if there's a hybrid meeting or a remote meeting, um, it would include the link to, to access that meeting virtually. We know that notice has to include a specific amount of details, so we're going to go into that as well. Purpose. Um, as I mentioned before, the Attorney General's office has held that the presumption is that public bodies will conduct their meetings in an open session, not executive session, and there is limited authority to meet in closed or executive session. So that would include if there's litigation, certain personnel matters or complaints, um, real estate transactions, very limited purposes outlined in the law itself for when you need an executive session. We know that public bodies need to create minutes, and the meeting minutes have to have a certain substantive content to them, so we'll talk about that as well. And we know that the timing for drafting and approving those minutes the recommended time frame is within three meetings or 30 days, whichever is later. So it's a fairly accelerated time frame to keep in mind. We also know that approval of the minutes has to be done on a regular basis. So certainly that's a big part, as we know, of what public bodies do with town. So if we break this down a little bit, um, we're going to discuss, permit, at this point, meetings and what is a meeting. So we know that it includes a deliberation amongst a quorum to discuss matters within the jurisdiction of that public body. The term meeting doesn't include, and this would be relevant for some of our land use boards here and members, an on-site inspection of a project or program, provided that there's no deliberation on site. So generally, in my experience, a best practice may be to say send one member of a land use board to a site inspection or a project or a program and report back to the full public body. Other times, there may be times where a quorum wants to attend, it may be a high profile member or someone else wants to, <coughs> to see for him or herself what's going on. And that's fine as long as there's no ultimate deliberation 
and ultimately the findings are reported back to the public body at a properly posted meeting. This question comes up all the time, as you might imagine. The term meeting doesn't include attendance by a form of the board at a public or private gathering or social event, as long as there's no deliberation. So all of you here today are very involved in your community, which is great. You're going to see each other at community events, barbecues, other social events. Um, and certainly that's fine. People can participate publicly or privately. But there can be deliberation or the appearance of deliberation if you are meeting in that sort of context. Any questions on that? So I think it's a good idea to talk about what deliberation is because oftentimes there is some um, the questions often come up in terms of what is appropriate to email or not email. So just a good idea to, to have this framework in mind as you all conduct your public body business. So as I mentioned before, deliberation is an oral or written communication through any medium, including electronic mail, between or among a form of a public body on any public business within its jurisdiction with certain exceptions. Um, What's important to note is that email is permissible with a quorum of a public body in certain circumstances. And what the Attorney General's office has said is these are some permissible circumstances. So a draft meeting agenda, I, I categorize them as scheduling matters. A meeting agenda, scheduling or procedural information, do you want to meet at the community center, do you want to meet at town hall? Um, can you meet at 4 o'clock, I can meet at 5 o'clock, those are all fine. Um, it's also fine to send reports or documents that may be discussed in the upcoming meeting, so long as there's no discussion or the conveying of any beliefs or opinions by a public body member to the rest of the, the public body. So what does that mean? I saw this report, it may be of interest, can we discuss it at our meeting on Tuesday? That's fine. What is not okay, perhaps, is here's a report. Can you let me know what you think? I think it's great. And people start replying to that email. So it's important to keep in mind you are allowed to convey certain information so long as the discussion then takes place at a properly posted meeting. A good idea of some public bodies that I work with, boards, commissions, committees, will put on the bottom of an email. For distribution only, please no discussion, or please save the attached for discussion at our meeting on Wednesday night. All of that's fine, just a little reminder. Everyone means well, but we all just use email so much, sometimes the reply all can come into play. So I just wanted to outline some practical approaches. I know that the law has a lot of different requirements, but Certainly, we all need to be flexible to allow all of you to do your jobs. So, some practical approaches to consider. If you're attending a meeting of another public body or social event, including if it's virtual, you want to avoid creating the appearance when you're discussing certain municipal business. I've dealt with many an open meeting law complaint in my career where there's some sort of insinuation or deliberation occurred because of the appearance of something, so it's best just to not give that appearance. If you're attending a site visit or a meeting of another public body, just consider posting a meeting if there's going to be a further discussion, or if your, your commission or committee thinks this might be something that will come up in the future, that's just to put it on a future agenda. If a member, and certainly everyone is entitled to speak at another commission or a public body, that's fine. You just want to indicate I'm here in my individual capacity and not speaking on behalf of the planning board, the CDA, the conservation commission. It's just a good idea to keep in mind that you're speaking in that capacity. Or, alternatively, certainly you can post a joint meeting, and that's fine. And that often is the case, as you know, with various public bodies, particularly we're at town meeting season or anything else, that's fine. Any questions on any of those practical approaches? Okay. Deliberation. Um, there has been 
a significant uptick in COVID meeting law complaints in the past five to seven years, not the town, <laughs> dealing with um, email. And so it's something that I always like to highlight just to put everyone on notice as to what the law requires. And I'm certainly happy to answer any questions as well. So we know that email is explicitly discussed in the open meeting law. We talked about the deliberation we include email. So I always caution public body members to just be aware of the reply all to an email and really limit it, as I mentioned, to scheduling purposes. You should certainly assume that any email that is written could be forwarded to a third party, an unintended recipient, and so certainly you'd want to limit it accordingly in terms of what you're saying. You don't want to ask for the beliefs or opinions of any um, other people bought you an email because it could then be forwarded to another person. And so certainly you would want to limit it directly one on one with the person. And you want to make sure that any email you're sending, certainly there's always a risk it could be published or put on Facebook or put online. So just to be conscientious of that as well. Um, social media is another item that we're seeing a little bit um, an increase in open meeting law complaints. We know that the Attorney General's office has said that individuals' postings on social media could also invoke the open meeting law. So some practical approaches as well to deal with that. You don't want to direct social media posts to other comment or other members of the public body you serve on. And if the matter involves, um, if you're posting about something, hello Joe, if the matter directly involves an issue pending before your public body, you might want to consider not engaging in that discussion in your official capacity. Certain people have free speech rights and First Amendment rights, and I'm not here as town council to speak to that, but we have seen an uptick if there's Facebook posts or Twitter, um, Twitter handle posts, to, to just consider not engaging if it's a matter before your public body. And certainly we always want to be thoughtful about the comments and how they're made if you do use social media. Um, certainly there's a, a huge increase in public records requests and open meeting law matters dealing with social media. So I've included here any questions on that for anyone. So attentive, I'm so attentive. Um, I've included some examples that I've seen and the Attorney General's office has specifically addressed in what can constitute an email or a social media deliberation. Um, so if there's an email, a voicemail, or a blog post that was, you know, Emily sends it to me, and then I send it to a third member, the third member sends it to a fourth member of a seven-member board, now we have a deliberation amongst a quorum of that public body. So the serial sending of emails, the, the notion behind that, of course, is there was an expression of beliefs or opinions before that public body met in open session under the open law. That would also include a reply at all. I've handled various complaints where there's been a reply all to an email, which then goes to the one, her, one member sends it to a second member, then that member does a reply at all. That could constitute, depending on its substance, deliberation outside of a properly posted meeting. This would also apply to a web-based discussion group, a chat room, or a social networking site, if a quorum of that public body is participating in that online. Any questions on deliberation, email, Twitter? Oh, yes. Thank you. Brian Solomon, I'm with the Atonement Board. If we have an upcoming meeting, and I look at it given these three cases that are before us, that the following, I had to consider what zoning regulations are going to be, should be considered during the meeting, you know, get ready for it. Can I send an email out to the board members saying, Meeting, make sure you go back to the following zoning regulations, but not specifically indicate we got the meeting to So, in, in my 
experience, if there's background information that a member would want you to have members be aware of, for, for instance, a zoning violation or any other comes up in the Board of Health context as well. There are two options, really, um, just so it doesn't trigger that deliberation. I think one would be to use a staff person to send that out as background material, materials for the meeting on July 28th, 2022. That's the sort of the safest option for the note to not reply until the meeting. Um, certainly, if there's a discussion on the agenda, we just want to be really careful that there's not beliefs or have you seen this or um, this may be something that could come up in the past. Information can be provided, but if there's any opinion or belief, um, it, it could potentially give rise to an open meeting on issue. So some companies would use a staff person to distribute materials individually to board members, not to put more work on anyone, but safe as that. Good question. Anything else? Now that the ice has been broken? Yes? On the agenda, is it okay to have a chain of emails going back and forth to discuss what should be on the agenda? That is fine. Um, if there's discussion, if emails are sent from one member to the chair, can you please place this, this on the agenda? Are we going to consider this at our upcoming meeting? Or if that agenda is wrong, can we push it off to our following meeting? That's fine. Generally, as long as it falls under scheduling purposes, that's completely sufficient. We just don't want any substantive discussion on any of those matters. So for instance, if someone said, oh, can we please consider potential enforcement action at 123 Main Street? I think this is a real problem. Don't you all agree? That could potentially be problematic if people were applying. The email is a, is a, can be tricky. Thank you, good question. Anything else? Okay. So meeting notices, um, generally the town, under, you know, everyone understands that meetings have to be posted. People understand the specific time frame in which meetings have to be posted. Certainly, I want to just provide an overview of that, just as a, a refresher for anyone, especially for newer members of public bodies. You know that generally, unless there's an emergency, and we'll talk about that, a meeting has to be posted at least 48 hours in advance, you know, excluding Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays. July 4th, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, etc. For a Monday meeting, so the notice would have to be posted on Thursday, and Emily could probably do this better. <laughs> um, if Monday's a holiday, a Tuesday meeting must also be posted on a Thursday. So it, it, it seems like a long stretch, but certainly it's to alert members of the public in terms of whether or not he or she wants to attend. The notice has to have a state the, state the date and time that it's posted. And if it's revised, it has to include both the original time and the revision date. So depending on how far in advance you post your meetings, if there's a revision, you'll just want to update that before. Any questions on that? Yes. Um, are you just referring to a revision in the day and time, not the agenda? So if there's a revision, if an item is added or deleted, and you still have enough time, so it's a week out, you would have the original date that it was cut off and then the date that it was changed as a second date. So both dates would have to go on the agenda? Yes, that's correct. So the question was, do you put both dates on the agenda? So if you have, um, the Conservation Commission says, we're gonna talk about these four items two weeks from now, then next week they decide we're going to add an item, you would include the date that it was originally posted today, and then the date that it was updated next week as well. Good question. And I know I'm not doing a good job with you questions, but I don't. So we know that the meeting notice has to include the date, the time, and the place of the meeting, and the listing of the topics that the chair reasonably anticipates. And you can tell, I hope by the intonation of my voice, when I talk about what reasonably anticipates me, will be discussed at the meeting. Um, if it is hybrid or remote, it has to include that specific information so someone 
login as well. Um, if a topic might be discussed at your meeting, you should include it in the meeting notice. It is better to include it and pass it over than not to include it. If it's something that's reasonably anticipated. So what is reasonably anticipated in the I think we're going to talk about these 10 items. I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about them. The chair knows 40 hours before the meeting that these, are going to, these items are going to be discussed. I've had open meeting law complaints where the Attorney General's office will go through a factual inquiry to decide whether the chair did or did not reasonably anticipate an item. So if it's something that may come up, I suggest you would be the we know that topics must be sufficiently specific to reasonably advise a public on the issues to be discussed at the meeting. I say it's sort of a four corners test. If a member of the public that has just moved to town, has never been to a town meeting before, picked up your meeting notice, do they know whether they wanted to attend your meeting based on what's on there? We'll talk about that in a little bit more. But it's, it's general or, you know, overview, specific information to say, yes, I'd like to attend the planning board's meeting, or no, I'm not interested in those topics. I think I'll go to the next one. The Attorney General's Office has also said that regularly recurring items generally need more detail than simply using generic placeholders, such as older new business. It's fine to put it on. You'd want to put sort of some categories underneath it. New business, 123 Main Street enforcement, old business, um, enforcement order, and you could list the property address. So you generally want to include more information than less. Any questions on agenda meeting notices so far? Some best practices that I hope will help everyone as you review and um, draft your meeting notices. Generally, it's not a good idea to use acronyms or abbreviations. You want to spell terms that are not generally known to members of the public. This can come up in grants sometimes, um, federal agencies, or specific information that may or may not be technical terms um, that a consultant may provide, for example. It's better just to write it out in plain language, again, for members of the public that may not know about it. If you are meeting in executive session, for instance, if there's litigation or another item that qualifies, you do need to still have an open session meeting before you go into an executive session, and you want to include the specific purpose for which you're going into an executive session. If your public body generally does not hold executive sessions and you need I don't want to speak for the town administrator, but certainly um, the town clerk and the town administrator who work with town council to facilitate them. Generally, best to avoid shorthand references as well, such as hiring or contract negotiations. You want to put the position down or include other information to indicate um, what specifically is being discussed. How specific, how specific uh, should you indicate what other personnel in yep. executive session? How specific or lack thereof should, should you be? So for example, excellent question. The question was how, how specific should you be if you are doing an executive session for a personnel matter? Um, that's going to be a little bit different, I agree. There may not be a reason to put down someone's name or position in light of a privacy interest that that employee or official would have. Um, and so it would be crafted in a way to protect their privacy interests. And so you wouldn't necessarily. So you just so indicate personnel. You would just indicate personnel. Good question. Thank you. <clears throat> so matters not reasonably anticipated by the chair would be added if you're within that 48 hour window. So something comes up last minute, if the board's discussion, <clears throat> you still have 48 hours to post. We're going to update your agenda to show the time and the date of the update, as we talked about before. Um, but you want to add it to your agenda if you could. And matters not reasonably anticipated by the chair may be discussed and acted upon. I just wanted to note that the Attorney General's Office 
takes the position that they should be put off to a later meeting if possible um, and included in a regularly posted meeting. So if it's not incredibly time sensitive, I would say that would be the best practice for your public body to consider. Posting notice, and this is to make the town clerk's job a little bit easier as well. Some practical considerations. Town stamp the notice to ensure an accurate record exists of the filing. Um, and a meeting cannot generally be continued night to night to night if you don't finish, unless it is again properly posted under the meeting law. Open meeting law. We have this question several times a year. We didn't finish our discussion tonight, the meeting went long. There was a very complicated hearing. Can we just, we're just going to meet tomorrow night, we're going to continue it. And it still would need to be posted. So if you are going to, you know that an item is going to be discussed multiple times, I would post it for those three nights in a row. And then if you need to not have that meeting, it's better because it's already been posted. But if you know that you're not, if you know or believe it, that you might not uh, have the time to carry over, how do you approach it within 24 hours? Well, you, you would have to say, I know this is a very complicated hearing. I don't think we're going to finish it. I know it's last on the agenda. I'm going to post for next Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. Or you would have to just continue it and then post 48 hours. Just playing devil's advocate. Yeah. <laughs> if, the issue, if the issue being discussed is very important and you need to, to come to some conclusion, that evening, uh, and you just finish the meeting, right? Okay. And you just try to finish the meeting. And if you can't, it, you just, it would still need to be reposted under the open meeting law. <clears throat> Unless it's an emergency. So our land use boards here know this as well as I do, but know this required under the open meeting law does not substitute or otherwise supersede any other um, applicable laws. So while there's notification and the meetings are posted under the open meeting law, it also certainly requires 48 notice as well as any other regulatory or statutory schemes. And I'm looking at Amy over there on that. Um, so certainly both need to be done to satisfy those statutory requirements. Any questions on that? Yes. Can I just ask? Um, sure. To be specific or not specific, a lot of the agenda you see is the end of the project or other business to be taken up or whatever. Is that sort of frowned upon as far as this goes, or is that still okay? So I think the best practice would be to include more information. And if you have other business on there, um, it, it could be construed as not specific enough for purposes of a meeting with us, generally. Um, in my experience, if it's, if it's other business, but it's not reasonably anticipated by the chair, it might be okay. Um, because it may be something that a member of the public raises during public comment, for instance. And so that wouldn't be reasonably anticipated by the chair. Well, some member, for instance, says, hey, I don't have this piece of information on drugs. Correct. Or I need this, or we can help me get this. Correct. Fair game, right? Correct. And so if there are something raised during public comment, um, there would be other business, for instance, and it's something of, some, of a very substantive nature, my recommendation would be to put it on for your next meeting notice, if possible, because it's clearly garnering a lot of information, you know, a lot of attention. So do you advocate for almost all agendas have something at the bottom called other? What do you frown upon? I would, I think the Attorney General's office would most likely say that that is not specific enough, and that if it's something raised during the public comment portion, for instance, you, you would put it on for your next meeting with us, if the chair is so inclined. If I could pick up on Peter's uh, sure. comment, uh, down at the bottom of the uh, end of the agenda, we did this open statement that says open, uh, open forum that gives the membership an opportunity to voice their own personal opinions about point A, B, or C, or whatever. Just an open discussion. Is that the problem? I think that um, it is not part of the public comment portion of the evening. It's separate apart from public comment. It's 
done by the public. But I would say there's an open that the, the public is not uh, at, at the meeting. But mm -hmm. we have an open forum, and you know, I might want to open up and say something on the right commission or one of my colleagues might. Uh, is that doable? Is that the resource to do or not? I, I think again, the best practice would be to fit it under one of those agenda items, one of the meeting notice. Um, so if it, it was open forum and you did it after each agenda item, that would certainly be fine. But if it's a new topic, it might be better to, to think about putting it down as a separate agenda item at the next meeting. And we'll talk about public comment a little bit as well. Good question. Emergencies. Um, these questions traditionally, back in the day, I'm now aging myself a little bit, but um, would really relate to weather related items or public safety events, et cetera. Certainly, um, COVID has changed that a little bit. But poor planning generally doesn't equal an emergency. And why is an emergency important? Well, if there's a real emergency, a public body can meet without 48 hours posting, as most of you know. So that would be an ice storm, hurricane, a nor'easter, a blizzard, um, certainly power issues in a community traditionally qualify as emergencies. You do not need to declare an emergency. The governor does not need to declare an emergency. Essentially, it's if there's a belief amongst the board or a commission to say this is of such an emergent nature, we need to meet without the 48 hours posting, it can be done. Um, and generally there is deference in that community to what the emergency is, but it is narrowly construed. So what we would recommend is if there is an emergency, I know we're entering summer storm season, so I'm knocking on wood, um, you want to comply with the extent Possible. And so what does that mean? Well, there needs to be a, you know, a decision that we're selecting at 5 o'clock tonight as to whether to whether you declare a state of emergency because there's a huge storm. That's fine. If possible, you would want to post that morning. If you can't, it's because there's no power and there's lightning and it's not safe for someone to come into the town hall to post, that's fine. Those are fairly extreme circumstances. If there is an emergency meeting with the Attorney General's office is held, is you really want to limit your deliberations or your discussion at that emergency meeting to what actually you need to talk about to deal with the emergency. You would want to take minutes of the meeting um, and then review those meetings at your next scheduled meeting. So there's an emergency Friday, you have a pre scheduled meeting the week after, that's fine. You're going to review it at your next meeting. If you do have an emergency meeting, um, and if it's safe to do so, then you're going to post a regular meeting as well and ratify that action taken. So again, there's a sewer break, there's a power issue, etc. It's, it's fairly circumstances. Any questions on emergencies? Okay, we're not hoping for any more emergencies. Okay. I know that you guys are meeting in person, so I won't talk too much um, about this, but I just wanted to flag it for you because there was a recent legislative update um, basically extending some of the COVID related um, hybrid or remote meetings through March 31st, 2023, and that was just signed into law last week. So I just wanted to go over that briefly. Public bodies are under current extension. It was just signed into law until March 31st, 2023. Public bodies are not required to hold meetings in location open to the public as long as the public can participate in real time through adequate alternative means. So that would include a hybrid meeting where members of the public body are in person and um, members of the public are at home. That is not required. Public bodies can meet completely in person Ultimately, that's a policy decision of the town. Any questions on remote meetings so far? Okay. Just a couple of practice points. If for some reason there is a decision 
then to, to move to a virtual platform. Um, you just have to provide instructions, as you know, so members of the public can participate. And this doesn't happen so much anymore, but you just want to make sure that that link is updated from prior notices or agendas, unless it's a single link that's always been used. And you're going to want to announce that the meeting is being um, recorded, as we did. It's nice not to do when we started our meeting, our training session today. And if your meeting is remote, you're going to do your votes by roll call vote, as we know. And all of the other requirements, as you know, of the open meeting laws still apply. So that means meeting minutes have to be kept, um, executive sessions must have to be for a permissible purpose. It's basically only suspending those two different provisions that say it has to be in a place open to the public and that all member, all member members have to be physically present. If for some reason um, there are technical difficulties during a hybrid meeting or a remote meeting, for instance, if a live stream goes down or etc., generally the Attorney General's office has said that it should be paused or rescheduled, depending on how severe it was. Um, and if there's a disconnection, that should be identified in the meeting minutes as well. So just some, some different determinations that have come down the past couple of years on this. <laughs> Through the end of next March. 
Um, but certainly there is legislation to, to do a, a more fundamental overhaul on all of that. But essentially now each community has the option to meet fully in person, um, remote, or hybrid. And each community is addressing that. Are there, are there attendance requirements as far as quorums or the chair being in person? Not under, um, not under this extension of the COVID bill. So it, prior to 2020, the rule was if you if there was remote participation and the town adopted a remote participation policy, you still need to have a quorum of the public body in person. Um, and generally, the chair would also have to be present. Um, that has been suspended until March 2020. And I will work with you on that. Right. Yes. yes. If a, a member of the committee needs to participate remotely and you get the uh, code to, for them to join the meeting, do you then have to open that also up to the public to be able to join? So I, I think the question was if a member of the public body gets the code to participate. No, no. Okay. Uh, one of the members of the committee yes. cannot attend the meeting and wants to attend remotely. Do you have to then put the information to join the meeting to the public so the public can also join? Or can it just be for that particular person to join? Good question. Is if there's remote participation allowed for a member, do you also, the question is, do you also then share that for members of the public? No, all the open meeting law currently requires is that members of the public be able to participate in a meeting in real time. It's a policy decision as to whether that's going to be in person or virtually, as long as there is a room, a physical meeting room for which the public body is participating in person, a hybrid is not required. Good question. Is there, is there, a, is there a, a policy, I think maybe from the town, that if, you, if a person misses a, uh, consecutively misses a number of meetings, that what is the action that can be taken? There, generally a town's remote participation policy will um, dictate how many meetings a person can miss attending before action is taken. I'm not aware specifically, nothing's required under the open meeting law, and I'm not aware of what specifically the town requires, but then turn that to the town administrator. So the charter does speak to four consecutive, <coughs> excuse me, four consecutive uh, missed regular meetings. Uh, unexcused, unexcused. Unexcused, right. There's some <coughs> qualified too, but the four consecutive would cause uh, the chair of that public body to reach out to the board to see if the person should be removed. Um, I don't know that that's impacted by what you're talking about now. <coughs> Absences or excusable, as the chairman, Mr. Harris has said, excusable absences in terms of illness or other personal reasons. So certainly, it's usually evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Good questions. Anything else? I have a question for okay. the about the road access. So, if you go back to the posting of the agenda, if on the agenda you say during one of the agenda topics is we're going to review Schedule A. And we that comes up, and everybody in there has a hard copy of Schedule A. Should you, or do you, are you required to post that with your agenda, the the actual schedule, so that people can access it? So the document. Good question. The question is, what if you're referring to a specific item? Do you need to then provide copies of those documents in advance of the meeting to the board members of the public? And that is not required under the open meeting law. I know that a lot of communities put board packages up that are you know, detailed and contain significant documentation. Um, that is a good practice, certainly, but it's not required under the open meeting law to provide those supporting documents when you post the meeting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so Any other questions? So this question has come up quite frequently, um, and I'm gonna pivot a little bit towards my public comment piece. Um, public comment is not explicitly required under the open meeting law. 
And I know that sometimes when I say that, it's a little bit shocking because the whole purpose of the open meeting law is to increase transparency um, and certainly allow members of the public to, to see what's going on in their community. But it's not required. And that goes for the same if it's a hybrid meeting or a fully remote meeting. So just something to keep, up, keep in mind. Um, certainly most public bodies require some version of public comment, and I would say that's different if you're having a public hearing. So I'm um, looking at our land use boards here. If there's a public hearing, including for um, any sort of permit or application or license, public comment um, would be required to satisfy due process. But generally, on that other agenda items, it's not required. So can I ask a question about that? So you're sure. saying that even though all the meetings have to be open to the public, we, they don't have to be allowed to speak? That, that's correct. That's For correct. a general agenda item, not a statutory public hearing. Um, the, the whole notion behind it is the sunshine laws we talk about, that people can see what their government is doing, but it doesn't dictate public comment or participation in those items. Certainly as a matter of practice, most communities do because they want members of the public to be participatory, right, in their town government. Um, I would say that if it's allowed, my advice would be that it sometimes it'll be 10 minutes of public comment or each person gets two or three minutes of public comment because we don't want to get into a free speech or First Amendment discussion. Um, but I would just note that even if there's a hybrid format of the meeting, public comment is, is not required in that as well. Okay. How specific, uh, when you go to the executive session, for personnel matters? Yes. How specific should the information uh, be uh, included in the minutes? What, you know, what segment of the... Uh, Good question. Good question. So the question was, <clears throat> How specific should meeting minutes be? If you're talking in executive session, you can speak generally and then speak to the personnel matters. Um, and we'll talk about meeting minutes in a little bit, but you want to include obviously the date and the time of the meeting, the members present, the votes taken, and a general overview of the substance of the discussion. The transcript is not required, but we also don't want it to be, and it needs to reflect accurately what transpired in the meeting. So, in order, I usually say. Similar to what I said for the meeting laws, if someone, once those minutes are released 10 years from now, or two years from now, or a year from now, you'd want someone to be able to pick them up and understand what took place in the meeting. Good question. Yes? Uh, back to the uh, 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 on the agenda of that executive session. When our committee goes into an executive session, it's usually to discuss a potential acquisition of a property in town. If we have to be specific, putting an address or member parcel against the, having an executive session, can we just put a property within the town of Harwich? Is that enough? That's fine. So the, the specific piece of the executive session is you have to include as much information. The question was how much detail should be put on the executive session you would want to put as much information as you can, certainly without compromising the town's negotiating position, litigation position, or other positions. We talked before about privacy rights with respect to executive session on personnel matters. The same would apply in a litigation context, potentially, certainly, certainly in a real estate context. So it may be that you can't include any property items. You could certainly put to consider a potential acquisition in town. That would be sufficient. Um, it comes up more often in the litigation context if the town is contemplating bringing litigation. Certainly, you would want to alert the other side that you are contemplating bringing that, so you wouldn't put that down on there. But if there's a case that's already been filed, it's public record, it's in the courts, you would then include the name of that case in the caption if you were going to go into executive session under purpose three. Good question. Yes. I may be missing something entirely. The third bullet point looks as if it's totally contradictory to the open meeting law. Okay, let's read it. The question was, is the third bullet point contrary to the purpose of the open meeting law? 
which says a public body may choose to have only the members of the body attend to the meeting in person and prohibit in-person attendance by members of the public. So what that is is a hybrid meeting that we talked about where we would have members of the Conservation Commission in person and then all of the members at home. And that was before you may recall there were gathering restrictions in 2020-2021 in terms of size. So that comes to it. No, 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 good question. All attendees in any form. Oh, yes, no, thank you, that's a good question. Any other questions on this slide? Great. So executive session, I know some public bodies may never meet in executive session, obviously some boards and commissions do, so I just wanted to, to go over this. I've given some resources as well, just so you have them for your own background. As we talked about, the process should convene um, in an open session beforehand, and a question often comes up, oh, we're just meeting in executive session, do I even have to put an open session on? The um, open meeting law does require that. We're gonna state the purposes of the executive session, stating all subjects that may be revealed, and this is pivots nicely into the question, without compromising the purpose for which the executive session is called. I've included the citation to the different purposes. I also have a really handy card that I will be happy to send to the town clerk and the town administrator's office to make available at town hall as well. Just trying to be a little green um, with the materials, but I'm happy to make those available. You would take a, a report of the roll call vote to go into the executive session and then announce that the open session will reconvene afterwards. Any records, exhibits, and documents um, used in proximity to the minutes, you would reference if you were reviewing a particular, for instance, a particular appraisal report or some other document as part of the executive session, you would certainly include that, um, include that with your meeting minutes as well and reference those. We're only going to want to discuss the matters cited, um, and certainly there's a risk that if there's ever an open meeting law complaint and the Attorney General's office has to review executive session meetings, meeting when it's in camera, which means in secret. If there's any other discussions, it could be that that portion of the meeting minutes has to be, um, has to then be disclosed and only the portions that were properly discussed can be maintained. Take all the votes by roll call vote as we talked about before. Any questions on this? Great. So, we talked about appropriate detail in the meeting notice, as much specificity as possible. I just wanted to also flag that the related vote to enter into an executive session also has to include as much information as possible without compromising the purpose. So that might be in some circumstances if personnel is appropriate for purpose two or three. Um, or if there's a case name which would impact the town's litigation, <coughs> so we want to include that in there. Meeting minutes, everyone's favorite portion of the training. Um, meeting minutes, we know, have to be kept for all meetings. These are subject to um, retention requirements under the municipal records retention schedule and they're fairly um, specific in terms of what needs to be included. So I've included a bullet list here to try to make it as easy as possible. We know that the meeting minutes have to include the date, the time, the place of the meeting, and the members present or absent. If a member is participating remotely but otherwise present, it would be included in the meeting minutes. The meeting minutes must have a detailed summary of the discussion for each topic, Again, if someone's sitting at home, looked at them online, or picked up a topic afterwards, they would certainly be able to get a sense of what was discussed at that meeting. Decisions made, actions taken, and votes recorded. No secret ballots. Any records or documents or other exhibits used by the public body at the meeting, it doesn't mean you have to keep it all together. Um, I know you guys are so good about including a lot of that information online in town, but certainly if you're reviewing a substantive report or anything of note, um, plan, anything that would be really informing the public body's discussion, you're going to want to reference 
confirms it in the meeting minutes as well. Yes, question. So you had a vote of six to three. Did you have to list the names of the person pro and the names of the persons con or against? You do, yes, that's correct. You would want to include, um, you don't need to do a roll call vote unless it is a hybrid meeting, a fully remote meeting, or an executive session, though. But I think most public bodies have gotten into the habit to just list who voted yay, who voted nay, just as a matter of practice. Yes? So that last bullet goes to my other question about we don't need to post the document to reference or review during the meeting prior to the meeting, but we do need to post that with the minutes or make sure there it's posted somewhere and there's a reference to it. So they don't need to be posted under the open meeting law, but the meeting minutes. So if you, if there are, for instance, six different documents that, that you discussed at that meeting, the meeting minutes would have to say, Chanel Austin specifically raised um, a point about the you know schematics in plan one, two, three. You'd have to reference the document so that if Joe was at home and wanted to see what that plan was, he could send in a public records request for that document. Okay. Thank you. I think most communities are making it easier on people by putting more information online um, to be transparent, which is great. Um, but the, the, the requirements for the meeting minutes and what has to be included is just a list of documents that are referenced or used at that meeting. Yeah. It doesn't include a requirement to then post those online. Yeah. The public records law, not to like, not to make, not to conflate the two, but the public records law strongly encourages communities to post documents that are of significant interest in the community on the internet. So I think that's why most communities are posting more documents online. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. Minutes without this, the, the documents that were discussed are pretty useless. So there, are, in some communities that don't post online, some of them be looking at the meeting minutes and see all these documents referenced, and then would send in a separate records request to ask for all those documents to then read the minutes for the documents. I think Joe would agree. Yes. <laughs> is the, uh, is the yes. timeline for uh, posting the or announcing the uh, executive session is different from the general meeting the general uh, The approval process? Pardon me? The approval process for approving the For example, if we go to an executive session, we write the minutes. <clears throat> How soon am I supposed to executive it is. It is a, uh, a reasonable time frame, but I would suggest the same time frame be used. That's the, the, um, the, the three meetings are 30 days is the time frame the Attorney General's office has said. Unless there's you know, reasons that it would take longer. Uh, which often is the case. You know, town halls have staffing, other operational requirements, town meeting season. Um, that's a general time frame to try to <coughs> Um, keep up with, but certainly people do the best they can. <coughs> yeah. yes. I think the question would also get to open session minutes versus executive session. Okay. So if you're dealing with a privilege matter. Oh, so I, I see what you mean. So there's a separate process for approval. Is that time frame? Thank you for clarifying. There's a separate process for approval of the executive session minutes. You would want to do it in that time frame I mentioned. If you're talking about, I've been in situations where yeah. the session minutes were not posted or announced or yep. voted upon or whatever, but up to uh, three months, yep. four months, five months. And so, if you're talking about then the release of executive session minutes, um, that is an excellent question. The release of executive session minutes is there's no specific time frame, okay. and the, the rationale behind that is executive sessions mm -hmm. are. You know, confidential matters, and often the purpose for which a public body went into an executive session may not end for years. Um, litigation, for instance, or the acquisition of property that may take a long time. And so public bodies should routinely 
people would be there in secular session limits to decide if they can be released, but there's no time frame. And even if they can be released, the purpose of the executive session has ended, they may still need to be redacted. If there's privileged information, if there's personnel matters, confidential matters that can be disclosed. So we're very careful in terms of the review of exact and release of executive session minutes. Good question. Yes. Is it mandatory for meeting a during the time to be included in minutes? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Is it mandatory for the committee or board's adjournment time to be included in the minutes? I think generally people include it. I don't think it's mandatory, um, but I think some people generally include it as a matter of practice. The question was whether the adjournment time is included. Um, generally people say the meeting are included at such and such time. Um, just to have clarification for the record in terms of particularly if it's also being recorded to make it easier to match up. Good question. These are excellent questions. Um, meeting minute approval, um, this must be approved and created in a timely manner. Approval, this is the time limit I mentioned with respect to the Attorney General's guidance on this issue. The next three meetings will have been 30 days, whichever is later. later. As you know, some public bodies meet very frequently, some meet less frequently, depending on the town matters before them, so there is some flexibility there, as you can see. Meeting minutes are public records as of the moment they're created, regardless of whether they've been approved or not, so draft meeting minutes are subject to disclosure under the public records law, unless they're executive session minutes, and that's a separate process. Um, and steps should generally be taken. Everyone's very busy. People have a lot to do. It's certainly a significant Taking with respect to drafting and approving meeting minutes, but generally steps should be taken to stay as updated as possible on meeting minutes for drafting and approving. Yes, question. Okay, I have a question about draft minutes. Um, when you say it's public record, they're public record, but if they haven't been actually filed with the town, how, how are they public record? So it is. It is fairly common um, that someone will be at a meeting and then we'll send in a reference request for those meeting minutes. Um, if they're in draft form, even if they're handwritten, they are subject to disclosure under the Open Meeting Law and the Public Records Law, even before they're filed with the town clerk. Oh, I'm, I'm not understanding. What, what do you do with the minutes when they're in draft form? Where do they, when you say public record, Sure. How, how is that? So I'll give an example. Um, if the planning board meets, the question is in terms of draft meeting minutes and are they public records? Um, if a member of the planning board, not speak, just generally speaking, a member of the planning board drafts the meeting minutes and has them typed on a computer or hand writes them out, if there is a public records request for those and there are open session meeting minutes, that hard rough draft is a public record as of the moment it's created. Okay, so it's not filed, it's just available if it's That's filed. correct. So generally what I will say is if there's a request for those, you have to indicate in the response these are draft, they have not been finalized, and then once they're approved in final form, those final minutes will be posted online and the requester can be notified. Great. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions on this? Executive session minutes. This segues nicely into the question. Executive session minutes may be withheld until the purpose of the exemption has been met, unless otherwise protected under the public records law. So, for instance, if there's an executive session, it basically includes all, all privileged information with town council there may be a basis to withhold the majority of those meeting minutes. Like I said, if there are other confidential matters, personnel matters, etc., there may also be a basis to withhold it. It requires an individualized review once the purpose of the executive session has expired. 
there is an obligation under the Open Meeting Law to review executive session minutes periodically and bring them back to see whether that purpose has expired or not. And this is the process they can either be approved in executive session for the reason that initially um, the public body went into it, or under Purpose 7, which is the Open Meeting Law, to say we're going to review them under the Open Meeting Law. There is a required response to a request for executive session minutes within 10 calendar days, and no fee can be charged for that process as well. So certainly if you ever get a request for executive session minutes, you certainly want to notify the town administrator and town clerk for that. Any questions on this? I just generally, I don't like ending with the enforcement process, but certainly want to be ever aware of it. Um, this isn't to scare anyone or to, um, to raise a concern, but I think it's just good to know what the process is. We're certainly all on the same page in terms of ensuring compliance with the open meeting law, and I certainly appreciate all the great questions that you all had today. Um, if there is, for some reason, a complaint filed against a public body that you're on, um, that process is that there's a written complaint form, and that's filed with the public body generally within 30 days of the alleged violation. The public body then um, deals with the complaint, reviews it, analyzes it, and issues a response in terms of what it believes the basis of the complaint is and how it feels it best handled it. And then that goes to the Attorney General's office and to the complainant as well. Certainly, if you ever get an open meeting law complaint, you want to notify um, the town administrator's office just given that 14 day time frame to respond. It can come up fairly quickly. If the complainant is satisfied and says, I like the response given, nothing further is required, I understand, I, you know, I accept this, um, nothing further happens, it ends there. There are circumstances where a complainant may seek further relief. That would go to the Attorney General's office for review, and then several months later they would um, analyze that and issue a determination from their office. Like I said, if there was ever an open meeting law complaint, I just wanted to outline generally what the process was. You would have to put the uh, open meeting law complaint on your meeting notice. It can be done in executive session or open session. There's either option. And you would just, the public body would deliberate on the concerns and the possible resolution. And if appropriate, you would authorize a response to be sent out in, in dealing with their complaint. There are circumstances, everyone deals with a lot of public business where things happen and there's a cure process where essentially items are put down in another meeting and dealt with at that meeting to try to cure a violation. So I've included that as well for everyone's information. There is a, um, a lot of large range of enforcement options from compelling future complaints to the open meeting law, attending a training, disclosing meeting minutes if there was an improper executive session, nullifying action taken, or in the rare circumstances, the imposition of fines. Um, in my experience, and I've been doing this work for a while, um, fines are generally imposed if there are repeated intentional violations, which means the Attorney General's office has cautioned a particular board several times not to do something, and then it has been done, there might be a fine imposed. That fine will go against the board, um, but certainly that's not a position that Anyone wants to be in. There is also a superior court process that the Attorney General's office can file to require future compliance, and three registered boards can also bring an action in superior court as well. Provide a couple of additional resources. I know there's a lot of material on the slides, and appreciate everyone's patience here today as we went through them. The Attorney General's Open Meeting Law website is great. They have an open meeting law guide. They also have frequently asked questions. It is very helpful. And certainly our website, I've drafted many of them, have a significant amount of open, open meeting law resources as well. And we're always here to answer any specific questions that you may have. Certainly these 
know the Dutch Town Administrator's Office, who's a great partner in this as well. So I appreciate everyone's time. If there's any more questions. Oh, question, yes. Uh, just one. Uh, either of those websites, I think there's listed up there. Do either one of those include actually how to run a meeting, proper protocol sequence of things to run a meeting? A proper protocol or sequence to run a meeting? Yes. So our office does. Um, certain item limits are available publicly online, but we have a card in terms of running an executive session or best practices for running an open meeting. If it's okay with the town administrator, I'd be happy to make them available to his office for circulation if that works. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay, great. Yes. If your committee wants to have a brainstorming, planning, goal setting session, does that be either done in a subcommittee, not a quorum, or can it gather together without notifying the public if you're trying to accomplish that long term goal, strategic planning session? Good question. The question was um, whether or not a meeting would need to be posted under the open meeting law to do a strategic planning <coughs> session or a um, retreat format for long term planning. Did I hear it right? Okay. So, um, in my opinion, if there is a quorum of that public body that is meeting to discuss long term planning, that would likely fall within matters within that public body's jurisdiction and it would need to be posted under the open meeting law. Um, I get this question a lot in terms of off-site retreats and the Attorney General's office would likely conclude because if you're doing long-term planning for a particular commission or a board, you're essentially conducting the business of that public body, and so it would need to be posted. If it's a training or a conference, that's a different story. But if it's discussions or goals or long-term strategic planning, I think it would need to be posted. Um, if it's a subcommittee, you would only be able to, if it's a subcommittee created by that public body, it's still going to be subject to the open meeting law. So the key is to not have a quorum. So if you have, <laughs> I also get it like, sometimes the meeting might if it's an advisory group, it can, it can be called a, a variety of things, but if it, if it doesn't have a quorum, then it's less problematic. Um, but we should, if that question comes up, we should talk in terms of logistics. Okay. okay. <laughs> we, have a, we have a session at six that may not be recorded. Okay. I mean, it also depends on how it's created. So there's case law that says if a superintendent, someone who's not subject to the open meeting law, or the town administrator, creates a subcommittee to advise him or her on a particular issue, and then it wouldn't invoke the provisions of the open meeting law. So the question comes up quite frequently in the school context, as you would imagine, where a superintendent forms various subcommittees to report back, and we have case law on that. But it is a fact specific inquiry, so we can talk about that. Any other questions? Janelle, can I ask a, a, of course. a leading question? Sure. And that would be if there's less than a quorum of a public body that has talked about something, is it true that there is still a risk if one of those sub quorum members talked to a member that wasn't there and so on and so forth? And doesn't the Attorney General have a specific phrase for that? Yes, good question. Question for everyone, we have a whole other but in terms of it's less than a quorum speaks about a matter to one or two other people, is there a risk of an open meeting law issue? And yes, the, the term is serial communication, 
whether it's for a book or an electronic form. Um, essentially, if the communication starts with myself to Joe, and then Joe to Emily, and then Emily to Amy, then you now have a form of a seven member board that you're now delivering outside of the context of a properly distributed. So, yes, it would be um, problematic. Unless it's just general catching up. What's the weather? If it involves a matter within the board's jurisdiction, I guess. Good question. Yes. So could you get around that by saying to your group, individually research this, this, and this, and then when we come back to the meeting, we'll discuss it. So the best practice would be to, at a public meeting, if the chair designates certain tasks to different members, I would like Janelle to do this, I would like Emily to do this, and then I would ask that those members report back at our meeting on August 16th. That's fine. If it's over email, it's best to have a staff, if possible, have a staff person do it. And if that's not possible, it should be one person to one person, but no, no communication or beliefs Anytime email is used to communicate on substantive matters, there's a risk of an open violation. So it's best to do it all at a public meeting. I mean, even, I have some communities that even if they're just doing scheduling matters, are you available at this date? Are you available? Should we talk about this? Let's put this on the agenda. They still put that signature line at the bottom of your email saying, please do not reply at all, no discussion of this, just as a, as a caution, because everyone does a million things. You know, it's inadvertent, but you write back saying, I think that's a great idea, and by the way, I think X, Y, and Z about this, and then that gets forwarded, as Joe was saying, to two other people. Now you have a forum of the board communicating, right? And sometimes the person that initiated the communication doesn't even know it goes to other people. So that one-on-one -on -one communication, while it can seem harmless at points, essentially it can become formed very quickly. Yes? How does a subcommittee handle a situation in which they're asked to develop a, a, an RFP that is going to be presented, say, to the but the rest of the committee hasn't had an opportunity to even see that. How, how do they share it with the rest of the committee? Would that be to have another meeting? So if there's a subcommittee that needs to report back to the, I'll call it the main committee, yes. they, would, they would post a joint meeting and discuss, the subcommittee would come back and report back. So it's all done in a open meeting. Or the subcommittee may designate one individual to report back to group's finding to the main committee and say we're recommending X, Y, and Z. Yes? So that would be like a work session, but uh, would it be posted, no votes taken, and votes taken as regularly posted? So work, sure. Um, so work sessions by staff or by members of the public body. Well, could be uh, by members of the So it should be a post meeting. It should be a post meeting. Even if it's listed as back work. So generally, if it's a subcommittee or a group that's doing fact-finding, advising, it doesn't, the classification of it doesn't alter the substance of what that public body may be doing, and so you have to look at a couple of things. I use the term subcommittee generally as sort of an umbrella term, but a subcommittee can include a working group, an advisory group, you know, all of these groups. And if they're created in 
in a certain way are subject to the old and meaningful law. Yes. So if you, if you have, so they would have to be posted, open to the public, meeting minutes, and then it would report back to the main public body. That's right. Yes. I think this is related to that. So if we have some proposals for capital for next year, and where the capital and committee wants to do a site inspection, what we described earlier, can we, if we do that, say with the department head that brought it forward, can we ask them questions while we're doing the inspection, or do we have to do what we've done before, Joe, and that's hold, write your questions and schedule a public posted meeting for afterwards or something to sort of ask those questions in a public forum so that it's not you know, perceived as a, mm -hmm. a break of this rule. So if it's a site inspection and the committee designates one person to do it, that's fine. That person can go with the department head and do the inspection and then report back. And maybe the department head comes back to that meeting for a further meeting with the public body. Alternatively, the safest option would be if a quorum of the public committee wants to go, to not engage in a discussion and then just bring it all back to the posted meeting. I observe this, what about this? I have a question about this. I think that's the safest bet. The question comes up a lot for land use boards that are doing site visits on property because then we get into NDA issues as well. And so if the form of the Conservation Commission wants to go look at a particular site and they decide, okay, we all, you know, we all want to go, this is important, and it's posted, then you get into private property issues as a member of the public. Um, there's no accessibility. So generally, if there's been a movement in the past probably five to 10 years to have one member go and report back to the committee in light of all of these legal considerations that come into play. And sometimes there are private property owners that don't want people on their property. Yeah, if you have, if you have a form, it's human nature, everybody's gonna want to ask questions, yes. we know that. Yes. So safer bet is maybe to go without a form and then yes. you don't have to risk it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, good questions. Have these uh, public meeting laws, uh, rules, or regulations, or provisions been revised recently, or they, they have been in place for a number of years? So they, they have been in place for a number of years in Massachusetts. Um, they were kind of wise. The open meeting law was recently amended 10 years ago now um, to have further enforcement mechanisms. So prior to that, enforcement of open meeting law was through the district office and then it was turned it over to the Attorney General's office with this creation of a whole division, the Division of Open Government, which is charged with enforcement of the open meeting law. The public records law, which is a parallel track, was amended last in 2016. And then recently again, um, one exemption was amended in 2021. So there were amendments and there was a whole division staffed to would be a more matters. But prior to that, it was through the district attorney's office. Are there a lot of complaints filed for the annual with the office? Yes. <laughs> Several thousand. <laughs> so last year, on the public record side, there were over 3,000 appeals in Massachusetts that went to the supervisor of public records. Um, I don't know the exact number, but I know that the AG's office that division of open government issued several hundred determinations on open meeting law complaints in 2021. So it's a, yes. I think there's, there's a lot of meetings. People, people have been, you know, people do the best. Everyone's doing the best they can. So the training to appreciate everyone's patience is really just a reminder of these best practices and just to reaffirm what you guys are all already doing and to ensure you have all the information as current as, as it is in terms of doing your job. 
to certainly appreciate all your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I offer my thanks to uh, Janelle and our town clerk, Emily Mitchell, I want to first offer my apology. Um, I am Joe Powers, town administrator, and I was late because the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was giving out free grant money, and looking at the FinCom chairman to let him know that I had eyes on it and we got our graduate grant, so we're grateful for that. Uh, absolutely, kudos to John for um, I thank you all for all of you for being here. Uh, and kudos to you for choosing the matinee. We'll do this again from six to eight tonight, and it's a smaller crowd. Absolutely, it's, it's a repeat performance if you want. Uh, but my thanks to you folks is recognizing that you're here because you're either a volunteer, who volunteers on one of our um, public bodies, you're an elected official who serves on one of our public bodies, or you're an employee that supports a public body. So thank you for taking time out of your schedule um, and congratulations because you've heard from one of the um, uh, best experts in the Commonwealth on the Open Meeting Law in Janelle Austin. So, again, another round of applause for Janelle for sure. <laughs> and then, of course, the, my partner in government and our town clerk, Emily Mitchell, for being here <laughs> and being there when you have issues, concerns, complaints, and whatever the case may be. And to uh, Jamie Goodwin and the Channel 18 crew. For video changing so we can share it going forward. So thanks everybody, we really appreciate you being here. Take care.